Just want to let you know, too, that there will be information coming soon regarding uh, youth, junior high and high school. And so if you're in that category or uh, have kids in that category, just uh, stay tuned. So we're in a series called Our Outflow War. And it's based on the chapter in Galatians chapter 5 and the latter half of the chapter, verses 13 through 26. And it also has its basis, the idea that Jesus says in John 7, when at the Feast of Tabernacles, he says, um, I have water for you to drink, that when you drink it, out from you can flow rivers of living water. And so when Paul speaks of the fruit of the Spirit, that's the idea of is something coming out from us that is, you could say, more than we imagine could come out from us. And rather than our lives being focused on what can we grab a hold of in the world or in, in our stories to provide for us that which we feel like we don't have, and so we have this search for, you could say, life, we actually have, as followers of Jesus, the potential of having living water or life resources from us that other people can take in, not because it's coming from us, but because it's coming from God through us. So that's the premise of the series. And then uh, in the series, we're looking each week at one of the characteristics of this outflow. And last week, we looked at love which you could say essentially it's other-centeredness or taking upon the character of God, who John described as God is love. So that was one characteristic. And the second one is uh, joy. And it's easy to think uh, that dying is the worst thing that could happen to us. It's not. Dying is not the worst thing that could happen to you or to me. Dying apart from a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, spending our whole lives separated from God, and then dying is the worst thing that could happen to us because available resources that could give us the living water we need for life eternally with God, we don't access. So it's a significant thing to be a source of that for other people, a resource that God provides to them through us. And so the fruit of the Spirit is that idea of what does it look like to be living from the time we get to know God through Jesus Christ, start a relationship with him, through the rest of our lives until he calls us home through death or until he returns. If you've been listening to me for a while, which most of you have, you know that sometimes I have dreams. Interestingly, often on Saturday night before I get up to share with you on Sunday, it happened again last night. I had a dream where I was in the hands of the Taliban. And the man in charge who would make the decision about whether I lived or died on that particular day was talking to me about the spectacle he was planning. He had already decided to take someone's life, and for some reason, I can't remember the whole story in the dream, but I was there, and somehow I was in relationship with this person and I had done something so I was like he could like let me go or just like let's kill two of them <laughs> and I was aware of that 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 uh, how I interacted with him could potentially be you're gonna die too wouldn't that be great we'll kill two of them so that was the nature and I felt in the dream like I was going to die So um, the person that he was already decided to kill was a Christian. And uh, 
he was kind of talking to me and kind of thinking through this whole deal, like this day that he was going to make, and wouldn't that be cool? And you know how some of the videos we've seen where they televise beheadings of, of Christians and stuff like that. So there was like that kind of a dream. And I'll just add, I'm not suggesting here that this is a revelation from God like the scriptures is. I was reading just before I went to bed a story about what it's going to be like for Christians in uh in the places in the world, basically, where um, they're not in control of their their lives, like Afghanistan. So what is it going to be like for the people in Afghanistan now that the, the geopolitical situation is what it is in their country? So the way God made our brains is that often what we're thinking about before we go to bed at night is what we dream about. So I'm not suggesting that it's like... I think it's a combination of that and God knowing what I was going to talk about so at 11.35 p.m., I woke up from this dream, and I thought, i got to write this down. <laughs> that was significant. So he wanted me to say something before my head got cut off or whatever he was going to do. And I, in, my, in the dream, it was like going to be a quick death, not a, like a painful, torturous death. And... He wanted that to be, you know, part of the spectacle, too. It's like, but he wanted to know what I would say, like, before it happened, if he decided to, you know, include me in the story. And so in the dream, I'm contemplating, what will I say before my head gets chopped off? I'll just suggest to you, if joy is not a part of our story, the things that we're going to be thinking about are not going to be about God or <laughs> anything positive. It's going to be, this is the worst thing that can happen, and we'll just feel it in our bodies, this, this dread, this terror, because if this life is all there is, our death is not anything that has any good associated with it, nor can we think of anything positive when that moment is before us. And so in my dream, which I then was able to remember when I woke up, I contemplated what should I say. And so what I decided in my dream that I wanted to say before I got my head chopped off, if he decided to do that, when I didn't know if he would or wouldn't, was what Jesus said and what Stephen said. Forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. So I didn't have this, like, okay, angry, you know, those terrible people, let's figure out how we can take them down. Or, like, how can I escape this terrible, you know, eventuality there was a, a a certain sense of peace and that if that happened now thankfully i didn't die in my dream <laughs> i don't know what that would have been like <laughs> i did think about Jeannie, and i thought about what will it be like for her if this happens so that was in the dream too so <laughs> uh in in uh, acts i think it's chapter seven we have the story of Stephen, who was the first martyr, and there have been many since then. There have been many this year. And what Stephen said as he's being stoned to death, not a quick death, a painful, torturous death, and he sees the heavens opened, and he says just before he passes, Lord, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. So the fruit of the Spirit, the living water that can pour out of us, is, the, a, I would say, a perspective, uh, a, an environment, a kind of a reality that we can begin living within that is different than the reality, environment, perspective that we would have if we were not connected to God because we think I need to grab what I can, what I feel like I need, what I feel like I don't have in my own resources from either people or circumstances in this life. 
And that becomes our focus and our perspective. And when we have that focus and perspective, it's very difficult for us to think that anything flowing out of us would be good for other people in the sense that this is like a life and death for them in terms of just transformative potential of something that could come out of me that could have that kind of impact on another person. I believe it is that perspective that Paul wants to communicate, that Jesus wanted to communicate, that is possible. But uh, interestingly, as he describes it in uh, Galatians chapter 5, the way Paul describes it is this is a, an arena of battle that we will be continually involved in in terms of whether or not we see ourselves as being an outflowing resource for the good of other people or whether we see ourselves as being, I would almost say it, a, an intaker of needed resources from our circumstances and other people. That's going to be the battle. It can feel very similar in terms of the want to in both regards. We'll feel very much like we need this thing from someone else, and so we'll seek to find a way to get it. And there are times when we're, I would say, walking with, in step with, being led by the Spirit, that we actually want to outflow the resources, the goodness, beauty, love, joy that other people need. So the way he describes it, Paul does in Galatians 5, is the desires of the flesh, and I would just say are born with sinful nature, would be the way I would define the flesh, are against the spirit. And the desires of the spirit, and by desires I think you could just add in want to, so our want to's that come from our sinful nature are against our want to's that come from the spirit. And our want to's from the spirit are against our want to's from the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep us from doing the things we want to do. The Spirit's going to oppose the things we want to do motivated by our sinful nature. And the sinful nature, the devil, his world system, are going to want to keep us from doing the things that are, stimulate our want-tos that come from the Spirit. So then he describes a list of 15 of the kinds of things that will come when we're being fueled, when our want to is coming from the flesh. And then he describes nine characteristics of what will be coming out of us, what the outflow of someone who's in step with the Spirit look like. And I believe he does this not as a new law, don't do these do these, try hard, work at it, because that's kind of totally contrary to the whole idea of outflow, that it would be a, a generated from myself thing. But I believe he wants us to be able to pay attention to it and go, wait a second, that sounds a lot like this list over here, which is in you know, like from the flesh, I don't want to. That is not who I want to be. I want to be walking in step with the Spirit. So we actually can pay attention and uh, imagine ourselves and actually desire to be doing the things that are consistent with what comes from the Spirit. So that's why I think these two lists are, are given here. And so each week we're going to look at one or two of the, one every week, one week we're going to look at two of the aspects or characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit. And two or three of the uh, works of the flesh. So this week, joy is a characteristic or an aspect of the outflow that comes from the Spirit. And I'm going to take the last two because I think they're in some ways uh, the Satan's or the world's substitute for joy. The, the ESV says drunkenness and orgies. It would surprise me greatly if anyone in this room goes, yeah, I'm struggling with wanting to go to orgies. <laughs> Whereas I do believe that the Greek word that he uses here that they translate or orgies, there are some of us that have at least in our stories and maybe consistent even now have some desire or it seems appealing at times to participate in what, what I believe the word means, wild parties. 
So drunkenness and wild parties. So first of all, uh, let's look at uh, joy. Um, this is a very comprehensive word in the New Testament. There are 60 occasions when the word joy is used, 72 occasions when the, the parallel kind of verb uh, that, that you, you, you know, you're being joyful or the concept of joy. So that's 132 times, and we are not going to hit all 132 this morning, just so you know. <laughs> But I just want us to get, uh, I guess, a sense of it so that um, we can enjoy, enjoy it when it's happening and understand a sense of what is this thing that could be outflowing from me that will be for other people, it will function for them like a resource, a needed resource, and it'll actually attract them to God to Jesus and what he offers when they're with me, if this is coming out from me. So um, here's the definition. It's more than a definition. It's kind of like how I sense that the Spirit would have us understand this in terms of what it is and what, what it's like to have to live within the environment or the arena where this, the resources for this to be outflowing is the arena in which I'm living. So I'm not thinking of myself as needing something that I do not have to offer to the difficult, challenging things of life. I'm actually, not in an arrogant or cocky way, but I'm actually confident to present, to outflow things, to say things, to do things in situations that it seems to me the Spirit is prompting me to do. That um, my experience of it will be joy. So here, here's how I describe it. It is a bodily felt relational gladness of soul. In our culture, probably for the last four or 500 years, there's been increasing emphasis on, I would call it, left system type approaches where everything is a problem to be solved and a diminishment of the, the like awareness of, of reality, of ourselves, of our relationships with other people and the value of them. And so as I understand the way joy is being presented here, it's actually something we feel in our bodies. And it's relational, meaning the experience of it will often be like from eyes to eyes. And it's like the sense that you get, I think that person likes me. I think they're happy to be in my presence. I feel like they're happy to be in my presence. And foundationally, that starts with us um, understanding our relationship with God such that we actually begin to feel the sense that God loves us and that he likes being with us and he wants to be with us and he wants us to be with him and he enjoys it when we're with him and when we want to be with him. And it's not just a dutiful thing that religious people do if they try hard and you better read that Bible because that's what good people, good religious people do, and you should go to church, and you should put money in the offering, and so I'm going to do all the dutiful things, and it's the relational component of it is completely lost, which I believe Jesus experienced from the religious leaders of his day, so that his strongest rebukes to them were in missing, in a sense, the essence of what it means to be in relationship with God by focusing so much on the duty of what they described as what good godly people do, and yet they were relationally distant from him and didn't really enjoy their relationship with him. So it's a bodily felt relational gladness of soul rooted in this, believing and remembering that I am eternally and unconditionally hesed, agape, loved by God. And I just put those two words in there because our Western culture understanding of love is often shallow, and it's more oriented to what, how the other person makes me feel instead of what the reality is of the relationship that we have 
with each other. So to know that God loves us unconditionally, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not, I think Nathan's trying kind of hard today, so let's, let's throw him a cookie, you know. That is not the nature of God's love for me. It's not like, okay, if I, if I move towards him, he's going to move towards me. He will do that, but he'll move towards me even when I'm not moving towards him. So, uh, eternally and unconditionally, Hesed agape loved by God, who through Jesus freed me from Satan and self-obsession, so I actually can say no to the want-tos of the flesh, whereas before I could not. This is now possible, but not guaranteed. Who freed me from Satan and self-obsession and sent the Holy Spirit to be with me relationally. Not like the, you know, the monitor that smacks you every time you do something you're not supposed to. That is not the, the essence of what the Holy Spirit does. It's like the, the person that, you know, like the shock collars they put on the dogs, you know, if they get, <laughs> they're doing something they're not supposed to, or they cross the boundary line or something, and the dog learns, like, okay, I can't go there. That is not what the Holy Spirit is. He's God literally being with us inside of us, relationally, as cool as that could be. So uh, he uh, functions as our uh, helper, advocate, guide, and enabler who continually reveals and reminds me of my new identity, my people, or God's people that I am now part of, our awesome future. Joy is strongly associated with uh, the technical theological word was eschatological future or what God has done and what is in store for his people for eternity and, and for, you know, after this life. The fact that that is settled and in place is and provides a foundational base of reality that does not require me anymore to have to seek out from this world or other people or my circumstances or my job or anything like that what God has provided for me and has settled for me in the future. Our awesome future and my outflow potential. So I believe one of the things the Holy Spirit does is prompts us or gives us a uh, an idea or a picture or like, maybe I could do this or maybe I should do that. When someone around us in relationship with us has uh, a need or just an opportunity to, to like outflow something good. To me, this should be what essentially characterizes the family of God's people is they are not doing to get. They are just being and outflowing goodness. And they're getting because other people are doing the same thing, but it's not a negotiated thing, and it's not a keep and score type of a thing. So that when other people who are not in the family of believers notice the Christians and their outflowing, they will say those people must be Christians. As the scripture says, look how they, I guess it wasn't in the scriptures, but one of the early Roman people describing the early Christian communities, he said, we can tell they're Christians because of the way they love each other. So on Friday, we, um, we were helping our daughter, Rebecca, and her husband, Jason, who were moving from Davison to Rochester. And so um, there's a couple things that they can't do by themselves, nor did it seem appropriate for them to hire to be done. We did opt out of like major moving, you know, like we'll watch the kids while you take care of the moving, which we've been doing. So we have been spending a lot of time with particularly with Harrison, who's two and a half years old. So on Friday, we volunteered. Jeannie would go down and help Rebecca. I would help Jason. And they have a trampoline in their backyard. We'll take down the trampoline. And it was to be decided what would be done with it. Is it going to be just packed in the garage somewhere and wait for next spring? Or will it be set up at the new place? So Jason and I get after it, and we do it, and we figure it out. We get it, and we go there. And as we're there, we're just thinking, I'm thinking, 
it's going to be easier probably to set it up because we just remember what it looked like to take it down and we can figure it out. And then a couple months from now, you'll take it down again and put it away for the season. So we kind of do this extra. Let's do that. I think the kids will like it. So um, we put it together and another, and it just so happened that we got done literally seconds before William walks from the bus coming home from school at the end of his school day. He walks up the driveway of their new house, kind of goes behind the house, Literally, he was almost in tears. The trampoline was set up. This is one of the things he thought, you know, this is one of the losses of this new place. I had a trampoline. I had a tree house. I had a hole that I dug in the ground and worked on since I was two years old. And he literally is crying as he's like, dig, you know, filling in the hole because they have to sell the house. And the trampoline was one of those things. It's one of those losses. And he looked at, at his dad and I, he didn't say words, but I can, I can almost, it was almost verbal to me, like it's like, this is so amazing that you guys thought of me and took the time to go down and get that trampoline and put it back together and have it here for me so when I got home from school, I could go and jump on the trampoline again. I would describe what William experienced at that moment as joy. It wasn't just, I got something that I wanted. It was something that meant very much to me was outflowed from people that I know love me, but also this adds to my knowing that they love me, that they would do this for me. So when we think about what it means to be an outflower of joy, you can never divorce yourself. We can never divorce ourselves from the reality of what God has done through us through Jesus Christ and what he has enabled and freed us and provided for us in terms of our eternal future so that anything good that he gives us now is like a reminder of all that he has done for us and will do for us. So we're not like doing it to get, we're just like, it's just, this is so awesome. But also it provides a context within which suffering and pain and difficulty is not devastating like it would be if this world is all there is and we have to get from this world what we think we need to survive or to thrive or whatever because if that thing gets taken away or it seems like it's going to be, then we're devastated because what else is there? But if it's not about what else is there, I know what else is there, and it is so awesome and it's so great, do we still feel the loss, the disappointment, the sadness, the grief of the things that we experience in this life? Yes, we do. But not as those without hope. It's different. So what is flowing out of us is, uh, I would say, deeply and foundationally resourced by a strong confidence in what has been provided to us through Christ, which we have believed and which we have deep and abiding hope for in our future. I think William's response was just a little sense of, I know my daddy and I know my papa love me, and this is consistent with what I know them to feel about me and what our relationship to be. And he just felt deeply joyful about that. So his brother, this is uh, chronologically a little before the, the other moment. So when Jason and I show up at the house after Literally, we're trying to figure it out. We have no plans. I've never done this before. Jason can't remember how he did it. So it's like we're trying to figure out how to take this thing apart for, with the idea that it's going to have to be put back together. It's not like we're throwing this in a dumpster and it's going to get it taken away. It's like we have to like, make it look like this again. And so I'm kind of taking these mental pictures of like what it's like, assuming he knows exactly how it works because he's done it several times. 
So we're doing that. We come back, we pull into the driveway, and we're getting ready to start unloading. And Harrison realizes that we're there. He heard the garage door go up, and he was with me, and he said, my dad is coming, my papa is coming. So he I comes out of the garage door. That was Jeannie, for those of you on Facebook. <laughs> She was with Harrison, and I was with Jason, so I'm coming up, and literally when he knows that his daddy, who he knows loves him, and his papa, who he knows loves him, and who he's been spending a lot of time with, because we've been watching them a lot, Jeannie watches them two days a week normally, and we got about a couple extra days a week in the last two weeks because of the move, he knows, you know what he wanted to do? He wanted to run to be with us. It's not like a dog that knows, that guy's got treats. <laughs> I am running not because I care about this person, but because he's the one that gives me treats. That is not what he's doing. There's no anticipation of something, a present, a goodie, anything like that. It was a relational longing to be connected again with people that he knew, loved him. He had an a, a environment or perspective of cared for love that when there was a little moment of absence, he wanted to move towards it. So he starts running down the driveway. They have a little bit of a slant on their, their driveway. He starts running down the driveway to where I was, saying, Papa, 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 like I'm so excited to see you again. And literally, had we seen him the day before or two days? I mean, well, it hadn't been a long time. He goes from... I don't know, hit a little something, but he trips and falls, and he's barefooted, and he scuffed his toe enough so that he's now crying because... So the circumstances of life bring pain into his story in the midst of his joy of the relational excitement of being with someone that he knows cares about him. So does he quit loving us or is he quit it's almost like he had a mixture of my toe got buffed up you know like like he's upset with that but i'm so glad that my daddy and my papa are here so he was literally kind of experiencing joy and pain at the same time which i believe that is exactly you could just take that up a few years and notches for all of us when we experience the disappointments of life it does not have to be instead of we can either feel joy or we can feel sadness or pain or discouragement or fear, shame. There's a sense in which it's, a, it's an environment that can encompass all the other things that life has in store and prepares us, guards and protects us so that those things do not have to have the devastating impact that they would have if we did not have a relationship with Christ or the hope that he provides. So, um, in the, the arena of hope, I just wrote a, a few things down here uh, that the kind of the spheres or arenas that I feel like uh, ho that joy operates in. And it's very closely associated with hope, as I've just described, and with peace. And I think it's because... Um, I, the picture that came to my mind was like the difference between swimming in a protected harbor where there's like a breaker for the surf and everything and you're never going to be you're like drowned by a big storm because it's not that deep. You still get to enjoy the water. You're in the ocean. All the goodness of the ocean is there before you, but it's in a, an environment of protected um, kind of joy. And then it's the difference between being thrown off a ship in the middle of the Pacific Ocean with nowhere, you know, you can't swim to anywhere for safety. There's sharks all around you, and it's like, there you are. The Christian is able to be in the, the seawater, if you want to say, in the world that we find ourselves in, but we'd never have to have the sense of, oh, no, what if a shark eats me? Or what if I don't get rescued? Or what if I get to, you know, it's like, doesn't feel good if you're, you know, if you're in a difficult situation, but we don't fear the ultimate end of goodness. So, um, real quick, um, 
what does the world substitute for this typically? One of the things are like drunkenness and wild parties, which is the, the two of the works of the flesh. And here's how we would define that. Just I put them together because in a sense, I think they have the same kind of attraction to the flesh or to our sin nature. Using a substance or an experience to distort reality enough for me to feel or imagine four times that I am happier and freer than I really am. That life in this world, apart from the rescue and restored relationship with Christ, that, with God that Christ provides, can satisfy my soul. And I'll just close with this, uh, this story. When I was a senior in high school and had been apart from my parents for three years, I lived with a family, went to a boarding school, lived with a family, then come back to live with my parents because they come back from the mission field. The first day of school, I ride a school bus with a bunch of elementary kids. I'm thinking second graders primarily. And I'm a senior in high school. I'm thinking, this is not what I had in mind <laughs> for my senior year in high school. So I go to homeroom, and I'm kind of just venting a little bit about that. <laughs> and one of the guys in the homeroom goes, I drive right by your house on the way to school. I'll pick you up tomorrow. For the rest of my senior year, this guy who became my best friend picks me up to take me to school. How cool is that? Now I, I, I had a little sense of, I didn't really have a sense of my identity, but I was really fearful that my parents would find out if I did anything wrong on the bad list and they're thousands of miles away, and somehow the magnification of a story from thousands of miles away about something your kid did in the school or with the family they lived with, I just had a tremendous fear that that would happen. So I was a good kid, maybe for the wrong reasons, like fear instead of because I really wanted to be good. Maybe there's a little bit of each of those. But once I came back and I was living with my parents, it's like they're not thousands of away, miles away. They're right here. I see them every night. And somehow that, like, you better not mess up because that is going to be really bad, that kind of went away. And my friend was attracted to this, drunkenness and wild parties. And I imagined that I could be with him, be his friend, go to the places he went, and just not do the stuff that he did. I found over months that the resolve to stay good in my mind, kind of the, the reasons and rationale for all this. So I tried a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and it's like there was some momentary sense, if you're under the influence of alcohol, you do feel kind of freer, and you could say some sort of pseudo joy maybe could be described, but you don't feel that great later. About April of our senior year, I started coming to the awareness that this was not the life that I wanted. And I would find myself going, this is supposed to be fun. I don't, I'm not having fun. And I look at the people around and just think, is this all there is? Like you go to these parties and get drunk and like do stuff you're going to be embarrassed about later on. And that's what, that's what life is about. So when I told my friend that I didn't want to do those things anymore, I still wanted to be his friend. I would have loved for us to stay friends and do stuff, just not do those things. He wasn't, that's not what he wanted to do. He wanted to keep doing those things. So our relationship broke at that point. Part of what the story is for us is to be more and more oriented to the things that can bring outflow of the fruit of the Spirit, like joy, and less and less, almost like more aware and paying attention to the things that the world offers or our sinful flesh is drawn to that don't have eternal significance, and they don't, they're not really relationally strong. They're just like a momentary distraction from what reality really is. And so I would just suggest to us, uh, as we go through this, we'll talk about it more in the future, but what does it look like to keep in step with the Spirit? And I would just say to be tuned in to say, that 
looks, sounds, feels like a work of the flesh. That's not what I want. I want this. And so the things that keep us tuned into the spirit and in community with one another are the things which will, you could say, encourage or stimulate the outflow of things like love and joy and next week, peace. Lord, thank you so much for this great and awesome picture that Paul paints for us of what it looks like for us to be functioning as outflowers of your fruit as we journey through our lives for your glory. In your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. And thank you for the food that we are about to eat. Amen. You're dismissed, and join us for lunch. <laughs>